But before we get started, uh, we would like to acknowledge that SAIT is situated on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Today, that area encompasses the Indigenous people of Treaty 7 in the Southern Alberta, the Siksika, the Kane, the Kainai, the Satina, and the Stony Nakota First Nations, including the Chineke, Bears Paw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. So um, fantastic to have you all joining us, wherever you may be joining us from this morning. And I see we've got folks from far and wide. Um, very quickly, I will do some quick introductions because uh, bios will be available and we're available with the invite. Uh, joining us this morning is Steve Brierley from Gallagher. Hello. Great to be here. Nikki Monford from Synovus. And unfortunately, Michelle Dolan had to uh, bow out this morning. Uh, it wasn't able to make it, but that's, uh, that's good. She's sent some thoughts along that we'll try to work into the conversation. And also on screen, you will see Lauren Bishop, who is our client development manager uh, here on the corporate training team. She's gonna be moderating the chat and uh, popping some things in, in the conversation as we go forward. So great to have you all joining us. Um, and let's get on to this conversation. I'm excited about this one. You know, the last couple of years have really, I think, impacted leadership in a lot of organizations. We've had to make some tremendous adjustments to how we lead. Uh, but maybe we'll start there. Just, Nikki, your opening thoughts on, you know, the importance of leadership and leadership development in general. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Greg. Yeah, I think, you know, I think the last two years has shifted a little bit of uh, potentially, you know, some of the accountability and the more human side um, that we need to start to more heavily consider around leadership. But leadership itself it hasn't changed. I mean, it's such a it's such a key part in your organization, your culture, the success of your business, um, and it has so many accountabilities within your um, company. Also, what happens outside of your company. So I'm just I'm super excited to have this conversation because I think we need to revisit some of our approaches, maybe get a little bit more creative um, in how we're how we're looking at leadership development and what the impact is of not doing it right. Yeah, I know a couple of really good points in there. I think we will definitely get to, you know, how do you change your approach going forward? And, you know, leadership is still leadership. Um, yeah. it, sometimes I think we overthink it and complicate it. But Steve, just your initial thoughts here. Yeah, thanks, Craig. You know, it's my absolute favorite topic. And, uh, you know, for me, leadership is so critical because it really drives an organization. It creates a culture. And, um, you know, especially over the past couple of years, uh, in my role, we deal with a number of organizations across Canada, and um, we're, we're really hearing the importance of leadership and helping people, of course, reconnect and get back to maybe the office or get back to productivity. And, um, you know, creating that, those connections in the organization and create that culture. So I, I just think it's, it's critical. I know we're going to get into some of the details here, but uh, never been more important time to have great leaders in organizations. Yeah, definitely. This, yeah, for me, I find it fascinating that I don't think leadership has had to face so many changes, so many impacts all at once. Like we have condensed decades of change, perhaps, into the last two and a half years. And that, you know, that in and of itself is just tremendous. Um, so, you know, and Nikki and Steve will just kind of bounce back. And Steve, you know, you're shining bright like a diamond right now as the sun Thank starts you. to rise. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. I'm um, good at That's, yeah. But it, let's just start with the basics here. And folks, as we go through, please do put your comments in the chat. If you've got specific questions, if you hear something that triggers a question for you, please try and pop it in the Q&A so we can uh, track those easily. I think, Steve, I'll start with you here as Jeff. Why, in the simplest forms, why do companies need to invest in leadership development? Yeah, thanks, Craig. You know, I look at it from the lens of talent management, let's say. Uh, first and foremost, it's talent re retention and attrition. We know for a fact that, we're gonna, that people want to join an organization where they, they can be developed. And, uh, and we also know for a fact that employees will leave an organization if they're not being developed. It's, it's typically one, two, or three top reason for people to leave. Um, I'm going to also say, too, when it comes to leadership development, you're, you're building a talent pipeline. And if you take it from a business perspective, it's about business continuity and making sure you have the right people in place to really, uh, you know, execute on a strategy and a plan. Um, it's so, uh, 
it, it for me, I think it's really important because it does help to establish what the culture in the organization is going to be. And you'll find that great leaders uh, typically create great culture. And I, I strongly believe that that has such a, a solid impact on an organization's performance and, um, and reputation on the street. Yeah, absolutely. Nikki, your, your thoughts here. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it contributes significantly um, to cultural retention um, and attraction of employees. I also think too that, um, you know, you can teach anybody a technical skill or a transactional skill. Those skills, anybody can pick up, but leadership is hard. And anyone who tells you anything different is fibbing. Leadership is hard. It's a different skill set. It's fantastic, but it's a different skill set that you've got to start embedding in your, your people. Leadership isn't formal leader. It is leadership um, in, in itself. And if you don't start investing at that from that onset, that hire to retire, you're going to continuously have cultural changes and shifts and challenges within your organization. And so starting you know, right at the get-go from the moment people join your company um, and creating that focus on leadership, formal or informal, um, will, uh, like, like you know, what Steve said, continuity, business continuity, it will increase your production. It creates an amazing environment to work in when everybody feels like they have a role in that leadership space. And so it just, it will shift how well your company does. Yeah, you, you both touched on a couple of things here. I think I want to double click on a little bit before we move on to the next question. And that, you know, great, I let Steve, you said great leaders equal great culture or something to that effect. I'm paraphrasing a bit. I, I'm curious and I'd love to hear the, the audience's thoughts on this in the chat as well. But it, from both of you, what do you, what, how do you define great leadership? And that, if we're going to talk about developing leaders and leadership, maybe we should talk about what that needs to look like to start with. And is it the same at every company? Absolutely. You know, it's an excellent question. And, you know, I think there's a lot of, uh, well, every day there's probably a hundred books released on leadership and, and what it means. And, uh, you know, it's something that we focus on is what does it mean to you as an individual? And, uh, you know, the definition that I typically use is I think great leaders help people maximize their potential. Great leaders help people be better. And, and so for me, that's a starting point with everything that, that I do or like to do. And, um, and, but from there, it's if you have leaders in place who strongly believe that they're there to help others, that spreads through the organization, creates that, that culture of, of connection and support. And I can tell you that I hear this on a regular basis where people want support or want to have that connection with their leaders, maybe not getting it, maybe they are. Um, but the consistent message I'm getting is when, when people feel supported and led and, uh, and pushed and challenged, uh, it creates a, just a great culture of performance. So I, I'm going to say that for me, it's, uh, and it's a great exercise, Craig. I would say that maybe everybody on the line would love to hear this from Chad. Um, why don't pe if people could post, what's their definition of a great leader? Love to see what it is. Yeah. Now, there's some interesting comments coming in there. Uh, Nikki, your, your thoughts on great leadership. Yeah. Maybe if you can, is, is it the same at every organization regardless? I think the root of leadership is the same at every organization. Um, and that is, you know, is, is really leading your people, empowering your people and not focusing on your own success. I think, you know, it doesn't matter what your position is, you're only as good as your teams. And that's really what a leader is about, is empowering and developing others to whatever their succession plan or growth plan is. It's not about yourself and it's not about your own ego. Um, but I also think there's a second part to that in that every, every individual should also be empowering or displaying, you know, whatever their corporate culture and values are. And to me, a great leader is somebody that really truly embeds what their company has, you know, determined as their values. And they show those and they exhibit those behaviors on a consistent basis. And they also expect others to do the same. And so there is, um, you know, there's a, a leader role in that leadership space of, um, you know, expect the same of others as you do of yourself, holding other people accountable, but also making sure that you are there to remove barriers and help your teams be as successful as they can, being inclusive, being supportive, transparent. I mean, we could probably go on for hours as I list out my own definition. Yeah. But it is, it's, it's about being, you're there to bring your team forward, not yourself. Yeah. Lauren, anything standing out in the chat to you here that uh, 
So I see quite a few things coming through. I'm just curious yeah. if something's got your eye that we can highlight. No, just the whole culture of leadership and really that it's not about um, just leading the team, but being a part of the team and being accessible is, is really important. That whole honesty and inclusive piece. So uh, everyone's agreeing with what's being said so far. It's great. Excellent. Hey, Craig, Craig, if I could comment, I'm watching yeah. the chat as well. And I, there's some really consistent words being used like support, trust, trustworthy, uh, which, is, which is great to see and, and read. Uh, you know, because, uh, and then this last one, uh, you know, someone who creates a psychologically safe work environment, which, as we all know, is so important these days. And it's yeah, hard it's to do, because yeah. that can mean something different to everybody. And so, yeah, yeah it's super important. Excellent. Um, okay, next question we're going to move on to. And Brent and Brad, I do see your questions in the Q&A, and we will work them in here through the conversation. So, uh, don't think that we that we're ignoring you, but well, there's a good spot to work those both in. So, so we've talked about why organizations need to invest in leadership. Um, can we take a look at this, perhaps from you know the individuals on the team? So, regardless of your title, whether you're the CEO or whether you're the individual contributor on day one, thoughts, Nikki. I'll start with you on this one. Thoughts around onus, responsibility. Uh, on the individual to develop leadership skills, regardless of what role they're in. Absolutely. And I think, I think individuals should be just as focused on leadership. I keep saying leadership, not leader development um, for a number of reasons. One, it's an opportunity. We should always be lifelong learners, um, regardless of what your role is. You could be a technician, you could be um, you know, in human resources. It doesn't matter what your role is. But the skills that come through in leadership are, are not those technical skills. It's about you as a person. It's around emotional intelligence, empowering and developing others, um, you know, helping to influence without authority and support and move things forward. So, you know, if you want to progress in your own role into whatever space you need, you know, you want to go, it could be a technical stream, a professional stream, or a formal leadership stream. In order to do that, you've got to embody leadership skills. And those leadership skills come out, not just at work, it comes out in everything you do. If you're a parent, um, you're coaching hockey teams, your kids' hockey teams, your kids' soccer, whatever it is, those leadership qualities also make you a really good human being. And so I think sometimes, you know, we just have to, continue to work on ourselves because also it's really easy for us to fall into bad habits it's really easy for us to just not take the effort um, and just go in and do our job and not grow as human beings and there's a level of personal success like that intrinsic drive and that feeling of knowing you're improving and moving forward and it's not about your performance reviews it's not about your position it's about you internally as a human being and I think if you want to progress in a company then from the work side you do need to manage yourself, lead in, in a space, be able to work in difficult conversations, difficult situations. And in order to do that, you need to have some of those skills and develop those skills. And they, like I said, to me, they transfer through not just in the, the workplace, but also in life in general. hundred uh, percent. I love that. And I love what you talked about being a better human being there. And, you know, Steve, you've written the book on how to be a better human being. Um, yeah. So curious, you know, you tack on to Nikki's thoughts there too, but I'm also curious on, uh, on your perspective around, um, you know, how much, how much should my company give to me in terms of leadership development versus how much should I go do this myself? Absolutely. Um, there's, the, there's something in there that needs that a lot of individuals and companies sometimes struggle with. You've hired me, so you should train me. That's right. You know, and um, I think the, uh, the concept, you know, you can lead others, you can lead teams, but you can also lead yourself. And, and part of that is taking ownership of your own personal development. Um, I, it, I think when people wait for an employer to develop them, they're probably going to be unsatisfied with the result. So I think it's what's critical is for people to say, look, okay, I'm not leading now. Maybe I don't want to lead. However, uh, leadership skills are transferable. I saw one of the comments about, uh, you know, leadership is both, you know, business and personal. Um, but I think it's a mindset. And if you have a mindset of, I'm going to lead myself and lead myself to where I want to go, whatever that is, and learn those leadership skills, like helping someone maximize their potential. Um, I, I think it's just so beneficial. But so 
uh, sorry, to summarize, uh, I'm going to say that employees are, need to own their leadership development. They need to take the initiative for, for getting the leadership development. You need to bug your leader about getting some leadership development. Mm-hmm. That's always worked for me. And, um, and, and, but find your own opportunities because, you know, when you think of leadership development, there's a couple of areas. You know, there's exposure, experience, and education. And quite often organizations focus on education. Um, however, the exposure and experience are things you can do on your own, like finding your own mentor in an organization, uh, volunteering to do a presentation for a group, being part of a volunteer group within an organization. Um, so I, yeah, I think it, onus is definitely, there, it's 50-50. I think the employer uh, should provide leadership development opportunities. And the employee should also, uh, you know, fulfill their leadership dreams by taking the initiative to find out what's available to them. I, I agree with that 100%, Steve. You, it's funny, you see on a lot of exit interviews, um, employee development pops up as a regular thing when people are, are leaving organizations. And I would say probably, you know, if not 100%, certainly 90% of those companies offer some form of employee development. Um, but you see these conversations through performance reviews and goal setting every year is what is the company going to do for me? And really and truly, the employee has to be the one driving that. The company is accountable for supporting them, but it's got to come from the employee. And I love what you said around that experience, that the three E's is kind of what I call it. Like You don't have to be in a formal classroom to get leadership development. Like Look for those stretch things. Put them in your goals for the year and hold yourself accountable and hold your leaders accountable for supporting you. Um, I think it's it's great when you don't have to necessarily go to school or to a course to develop those skills. Find somebody, um, Steve said, like a mentor that you're like, wow, I really want to learn more about how they're doing, what they're doing and how they're doing it um, and get into the space in there. But it definitely, I, it's absolutely um, a dual accountability. You can't just depend on the company to pick you and say, hey, you're going to be our next leader. You've got to step up to the plate and, and find that within yourself as well. I love that. And Lauren, maybe we can pop those. Perfect. You just did. Uh, those three. Well done. That was uh, how, to, how to lead out ahead of me on that one. Um, but yeah, e- exposure, experience, and education. I love that, Steve. I think that was, that was terrific. Um, so we're going to switch into another question here. And Brad, yours will tie into this. <clears throat> and so we kind of set the stage for why do you need to invest? Why do individuals need to invest in themselves? Where does it go wrong, right? So, you know, why does or where does leadership development go wrong? Um, Which kind of leads into Brad's question, which is what does good investment into leadership look like? And where do we need to invest into leaders? So we'll we'll kind of come to Brad's in a second, but Nikki, I'm going to start with you on this whole concept of what does bad leadership development look like? Where does leadership development go wrong? Uh, how do companies mess this up? That's a good, juicy question. Um, you know, I think there's there's a few different answers. But typically, I think what happens is a lot of people get promoted and are moved into leadership positions because they're really good at what they do. And that's fantastic. But they're really good at what they do technically. And so that's where some of the leadership pieces go wrong. So then all of a sudden, we've got people in positions that are really good technically, but are struggling moving from a management mindset to a leadership mindset because they've been rewarded for having a technical or a management mindset on getting work done. And so then you're starting to try and fix the culture. Um, right, so you've got these leaders, they're not necessarily, you know, showing or exhibiting the leadership skills that you want them to in leading their teams, and now you have to try and fix it. What needs to happen is that actually should be part of your um, employee development or leadership development roadmap from hire to retire. You could have a new employee coming that you're like, man, you know, Steve's awesome. We want to keep our eye on Steve. And so it's actually like a formal talent review. You started as an individual contributor, you're like, does somebody want to keep in the company? What are we going to do from the get-go to help support some of that leadership development? And it doesn't mean you have to tag people as high potentials right away, but have a program or like design some of your employee and leadership development so that people can start to learn the culture and exhibit those behaviors right at the get-go. And as they move through their, their program, whether I said it's formal or informal, they're already exhibiting what you're looking for in leaders. I think mm-hmm. the challenge too. Um, is that we create these great programs and you see them everywhere. It also means you've got to be able to sustain them, but you also need to make sure it's in alignment from the top down. 
often what happens is you have a program for individual contributors, you have a program for your frontline or your middle managers, then you have a different program for your executive level. That's fine, but is it the same common language? Is it the same expectations or are, you, are they tied together? Because they are different roles and they are different skill sets. But if you don't have a similar culture, um, and I've seen that many times where you've got a really different program and it actually contradicts or clashes with what you're also trying to develop your leaders in. And so there's gotta be some form of continuity, some form of, like I said, hire to retire. What is your talent review and your succession plan right from the get-go? Um, and tell your people that you think they're great and you'd love to help them develop. Don't wait until uh, there's an opportunity. Yeah. Get them right at the front and go, you're gonna rock it here. What can we do with you through this over the next five years? And, and what's our potential? And really, really engage it right from the start. Absolutely. I love, there's lots there to unpack. Steve, thoughts on where does it go wrong? What does bad development look like? Uh, I'm thinking, of, say a, the I'm thinking of a TV show. I don't know, but, uh, uh, you know, and if I kind of put the, the lens of when I, was buying a lot of leadership development training and all of the mistakes that I made. So it's some of the things that I personally experienced, you know, leadership development shouldn't be a drive-by. You know, it shouldn't be a one-off. It needs to be integrated with the business. It needs to be tied directly to the business strategy. There's got to be sustainability. Um, uh, you know, after, if it's a session, whatever it is, if it's coaching, I think it, that integration with where the business is going is, is absolutely critical. Um, I think that uh, often we maybe rely too much on some academic models that are out there that have been around mm -hmm. for a long time. And I think we need to look differently at, at, at how people can be uh, developed. And um, to Brad's question about measurement, uh, I can just share something that uh, it was part of a project when I was at Enbridge. We were critical about getting return on investment for any dollar we spent for leadership development. So what we ended up doing was we would do a, uh, um, a kind of a inform on the formal 360 with the person's leader. So if the person took a course, we were looking for movement. We're looking to see whether they are, their behaviors had changed, whether leadership skills had been developed. So we did a one month and a six month follow up with everybody's leader to see whether there'd been any movement. We were actually able to uh, determine that um, this worked and some things didn't. So it was very helpful for us. I'd recommend, and it's a really simple process. It's not, not hard to do. This was based on formal education or courses, but you can also do coaching or mentoring or even ex experiences. So I, I think that ROI is uh, important. And I can tell you, uh, for me to attain a budget for leadership development, I had to show ROI. And this enabled me every year to say, well, this is valuable. We are moving the needle. And here's some of the evidence that I've been able to gather in some of the numerical data. So I'd highly recommend that. Uh, I think that's, that's an area that a lot of companies struggle with, right? It's versus, you know, okay, we've, put, we've got 1,400 leaders. We've put 750 through this course, 600 through that course. Everybody's taken it. That's not your return. That's bums yeah. and bits. You know, it's yeah, like- That's a metric. Absolutely. Shifting in your culture. Yeah, that's, that's a great yeah. point. Yeah, it's the first phase. And, I, you know, I, I, and I think, yeah. too, sorry, I was going to say, too, that we, uh, we don't have to complicate this. This is really, everybody has a leader. <laughs> the CEO has a leader. That's the board. I mean, everybody has a leader that they need to respond to. So just doing that, that feedback loop uh, with someone's leader about what they've done, I think, can be very powerful. Um, do, you, do you think this concept of ROI on investing in leadership development is, is sometimes too focused on folks trying to figure out the dollars and cents of it? Like what? Like what like, and maybe we can go on this one for a couple seconds, but sure. you gave a good example there, Steve, about seeking the feedback and seeing if the needle moved, right? Like, yeah, the, it's the, the generic, did the needle move? But can we get a little bit more granular on what oh. this might look like for good return? Absolutely. Uh, so specifically, we were measuring eight different things uh, and whether somebody was engaged and whether they were uh, uh, successful as a leader. Uh, just to share a couple of the things, it was attrition on their teams. So uh, we know that when leaders lose a lot of employees, there's something wrong there. We knew about engagement and when low engagement on a team, typically it's usually a leadership issue. Um, so, uh, with the help of some very smart people in the back end, I worked with an actuary actually over at Enbridge, 
uh, we were able to compile that data and we had some incredible information. Um, Cause the reality is uh, there's not an endless budget for development. No. And, um, but you want everybody to have an opportunity to develop. So uh, this enabled us or me when I was there as uh, uh, in charge of talent to, to make that business case to the executive team and say, this is why it's so important to develop your, your leaders. And then you, even from there, you could further quantify it. For example, if your attrition rate is really high within a leadership team, you can quantify that and find out what's cost to replace those people. Yeah. So the ROI, like it just depends on how deep you want to go. But um, I, I think, and even from a, from someone who is, you know, buying leader, I wanted to know what was working. You know, I, I, as Nikki said earlier, I didn't want to just check the box. I wanted to make sure that whatever we were doing had an impact. And that was the one way for me to find out. It was, it was through that feedback loop from the leader, but there were other things as well to measure. Cool. Sorry, Nikki, long answer. <laughs> Nikki, any thoughts on return or, or measurement? Yeah, I think I think it's it's super important because they're not, you know, leadership development is 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 expensive. Whether you do it in-house, out house, it doesn't matter which way you go, there is a significant investment and you do need to make sure you're getting a return for a number of reasons. I think sometimes, you know, engagement surveys also speak volumes. Uh, we've used those um, as kind of an overall measure on potentially our culture and the shift that's going. But then when you can drill down, if you do the engagement surveys the right way, you can drill down and actually see if there's shifts within specific areas, uh, teams, leaders, and so forth. And that's a great way also to hold your, your company and your leaders accountable uh, based on however you're, you know, positioning those questions. But we've also, I've also used those as the expectations. You know, if we've done an engagement survey and we've got areas where it's, again, not transactional, people aren't feeling empowered, people are leaving, as Steve was saying, that attrition piece, you have to shift those numbers. And that's the measure um, that we use versus anything else at times. Saying this needs yeah. to, you know, we're going to resurvey the team in 12 months. We expect to see this. How are we going to get there? Yeah. Yeah. But I think you touched on your last comment there too, this whole concept of what is the timeline? that we're looking yes. at for this return, right? You know, I think we've clearly established this is not a, Steve, to your point, a drive-by, a one and done intervention and all of a sudden our leadership is miraculously better. This takes time. And I think that's, um, you know, from being the side of selling support to this thing where um, sometimes we run into that conversation, well, how quickly will this take effect? Mm -hmm. That's gonna depend it's on people. Right, that's a tough one. So it's tough. Yeah. So looking forward, then, um, you know, what can we do? And this is kind of really the the crux of it now. What can we do to make leadership development better for organizations and better for people? And this touches a little bit on uh, Brad's other question. In here is where do we need to invest? What's currently being missed in the investment? So, um, Steve, I'll start with you on this one, and then. Sure. Thanks. Nikki, we can get you to build off that. Uh, excellent question. And I think the first thing for me is, you know, it needs to be somehow directly integrated with the business. It's, you know, there's got to be some kind of connection there. Um, and what I mean by that is a lot of the leadership development we're doing now, we integrate a business case. We, we get people to demonstrate what they've learned. If it uh, typically a series of, of, of sessions or courses, or they're doing some coaching, um, something we've, we've been very successful at is getting leaders to deliver some of the, the uh, leadership development. Um, but the one thing that I just want to point out that has been a really interesting trend over the past couple of years, psych psychological safety has been around for a long time. It's not a new topic, but when you think about it, it's really hard to have great leadership development if you don't have psychological safety in the room or in the organization. Uh, Cause to me, great leadership development is when you have that robust conversation, people disagree, in the room or they argue. I mean, that's how we, we get better at what we do. So uh, I know our focus lately has been on working on helping leaders create that psych safety. And psych safety simply means where people feel comfortable sharing their ideas and thoughts without the feeling of, of retribution or uh, someone making fun of them. So it, imagine if every session started like that, uh, and people come to the room with this open mind, I think, it, I think it'd be fantastic. Because I've seen the reverse, by the way, where we, you know, leadership programs, you know, you've got people who are, you know, uh, 
not open to sharing their thoughts and ideas. And it's just not as, as rich, uh, as rich an experience. So um, yeah, starting with psych safety for me, I know it's a bit tactical, but I think it's really important to set the stage and uh, integration with the business. And I, I'm going to say lately, we've been doing a lot where we integrate real business cases. Uh, Sorry, one more, if I can do one more thing, I'm sorry, I'm going along on this, but uh, most recently something that, uh, uh, that we've ex- we've launched is strategic decision teams, and what that simply means is bringing people together in an organization after they've learned something about a topic, and having them to work on that project as a team to demonstrate what they've learned, and then presenting that information later on to a senior executive team or a leadership team. Um, that like truly, that. So yeah. So that there's there's some more ROI there where people actually, and I've seen. Uh, sessions where businesses have saved hundreds of millions of dollars because they've been able to get the people together and, and work. So I, these strategic decision teams are uh, not a new thing, but uh, I think it's an important integration. All right. Some good stuff in there. Nikki, your thoughts on what can we do to make it better? We've got a couple minutes to dive into this one too. So I think there, I mean, I think there's a lot we can do. I think um, the programs have to be genuine and authentic. I think there's a lot of, um, you know, you can buy a lot of books, you can buy a lot of great programs. Um, there's a lot of buzzwords. There's a lot of a lot of stuff out there. But I think when you're looking at, you know, how can we make it better, you need to look at your your organization and actually really determine what the gaps are before just, you know, kind of sliding in. We're going to do this program and off we go. What is it you're looking for and why? Um, because I think sometimes, too, leadership development doesn't necessarily solve all the problems. And so I think you really need to look at what's going on in the organization before you determine what kind of leadership development you're going to do. And it should be continuously reassessed as you move forward. But I think the program needs to be authentic and it needs to be relevant and pragmatic. Um, and I love what Steve was saying, you know, kind of the um, action plans, um, right? After you've done a course, you've got a project or it's related to something, you bring it back and you deliver it. I also think, you know, one thing that, that triggers for me, I know even myself when I've gone through courses, I'm always talking to my leader about the courses that I'm taking. But are we talking to our teams um, that mm-hmm. we're leading? And we talk about that psychological safety and that vulnerability. We're in, uh, you know, leaders are in these courses for a reason. We want to develop their skills or leadership skills, even if they're just employees and not formal leaders. And I shouldn't say just employees. They're individual contributors or formal leaders. And I think that, Sometimes we don't share or participants don't share downwards. And so wouldn't it be great if leaders went to their teams to say, hey, I'm doing this course. Here are the things that I'm working on. Here's what I love. I'm going to bring it back. Can you share with me how I'm doing? Like ask for feedback and have an opportunity to actually implement what you're learning and be prepared to fail at it. And I mean that sincerely because we have this expectation. We're talking psychological safety. Part of that is allowing people to fail. And allowing people to go, oh my gosh, this is really hard at any level. And that in itself will start to create that space for other people to also try and learn and implement what they're learning. And I sometimes feel like there's a bit of a a status that goes with leadership development programs. I'm in a leadership development program. I'm great. I'm this. Well, you also need to learn and grow and share that with your teams and share that with your colleagues. Um, And I think that can shift the outputs because you're creating two-way conversations and that feedback. It doesn't always have to be a 360. It doesn't always have to be like a formal. It should be ongoing feedback. And I think that can move the medium as well. And I also think that that should be all the way up the line. Wouldn't it be great if you had a CEO that said, hey, I'm going to this course. Here's what I'm going to try. Are you ready? And to be able to see that communication come back to the organization and understand what where every level is doing in their leadership development space. I think has the potential to shift your culture, which will give you a much higher output. Yeah, and the, you know, think of the psychological safety you can start creating in your group if as a leader, you're vulnerable enough to sit there and say, okay, here's what yes. I tried to learn. Is, is it yes. actually working for me, right? And be prepared to get no as an answer. Yeah. Right? One thing to ask for feedback, be prepared that you might not be doing it well, and that's okay. We're human. Yeah. We're just doing what we can do. We're doing the best that we can do. Yeah, yeah ab- absolutely. Steve, other thoughts in here? 
Uh, there's lots going on in the chat as well. And I'm, I've been trying to keep up there, Lauren. I'm not sure if there's anything that you want to pull out. I know there's a couple more questions that we will definitely get to in the Q&A, folks. So, but this, this whole, like, if we don't come out of the last two and a half years trying to think about how we do leadership better, right? And let's face it, there's been some great examples of leadership and some organizations have done some really tremendous stuff over the last two mm -hmm. and a half years because they've had to, and they've yeah. really risen to the occasion. But, you know, the great resignation, the great rethink, whatever you want to call it, folks are looking for something different in their employer and different in their role and probably from their leader going forward. So how we develop those leaders going forward has to kind of change along with it. Mm -hmm. I would add the great disengagement as well. I don't know if that's a term yet, but uh, I think that's, we're starting to hear that quite often. Um, so, yeah, I, I, you know, I agree with everything that Nikki uh, had just mentioned before. It's, um, you know, leadership development is, uh, it's, it's critical to the success of a business. And I mean, if you look around, you find organizations that have, there's so many in, great ones in Canada that have robust leadership development programs. And you can tell by the culture and by their performance, uh, you know, by the performance, the financial performance of, performance yeah. of the organization. So it's, it's, it's all there. I mean, it's, uh, I think it's a matter of taking taking the action uh, to to make it happen. So. Yeah, I think too. If I can just add on too, I think we also need to create a space in our, our programs where people can bow out, and I don't mean drop out of the program, but we need to create a space where somebody can say, you know what, I actually don't want to do this. I actually don't want to be a formal leader, and for it to be okay. Um, you know, we look at emerging leader programs, for example, if we talk about formal leadership and you've got these, um, you know, again, some of you, Steve, you know, hey, great, we've got Steve, he's fantastic. Let's put him into this emerging leader program. Well, I, you know, have we had a conversation with Steve to see if he actually wants to be a leader? Because hmm. it's okay to say no. And I know, you know, pre in previous um, worlds, we've actually developed um, programs for people that we think are high potentials or they think they're high potentials and want to look at being a formal leader to actually tell them how hard it is. And it's not all glamour and it's not all the big paycheck, everything else and, and the, you know, the, the pride that goes with it. It's actually giving up a lot of what you love doing um, because you're not doing the transaction and it's leading humans. And we don't always allow people to actually come out of that going, yeah, this is not for me. Or if somebody's in a leader role and they need development, what if actually the development is for them to actually become an individual contributor that still has really amazing leadership skills, but doesn't have to lead people. And I just think we miss that mark when we're looking at our programs is we're looking at how to increase people's leadership skills and behavior, but are we actually looking at what do they want to do? Because there's a stigma. And, and I've known people that have stepped out of leadership roles and it has been the best thing for their career. Man, that's hard. That's hard all and so I think that needs to be built into how we look at leadership because they yeah. like, put yes. their expectations and what they want to do. And that's perfectly fantastic. Yeah, re really well said. Um, it, it's also kind of, for me, touches a little bit on the concept. You know, I know some organizations that will um, provide leadership development as the reward to the high potentials versus investing in leadership development for everybody. Yeah. And that, that one, that, right that was a little counterintuitive to me, right? So, Absolutely. Um, so we touched, you, you both talked a lot about psych safety. Obviously that's a skill that needs to be developed going forward. Um, there's a question here from Brent. Uh, you know, many things have changed for leaders, including the migration to servant-based leadership. And where I'm going with this one is his question is, what will not change for leaders going forward? Um, so I'm curious to get your thoughts on that because then I do want to transition into what skills are leaders going to have to develop going forward that perhaps they haven't had to in the past. So what, what won't change for leaders? Steve or Nikki, we'll start with Nikki on this one. Um, I think, I mean, you're still, you know, if you're in a, a, a formal leader role, what's not going to change is you're still leading human beings. And so, so there's still performance expectations. There's still those, you know, base pieces that are going to be there. You're still going to have um, difficult conversations. You still have to, you know, move the business and produce those pieces 
that are the job, so to speak, those are not going to change, right? You're, you're employed, that's not going to shift. Um, I think what, what is shifting and what needs to continue shifting is our approach to the human side. And I always call it the human side. I know they talk about leadership mindset versus uh, management mindset, but we need to pay more attention to the people. But I think at the same time, and I think this is a struggle in, with leadership right now, is finding that balance between what is the business need and what are the humans need? Because we're still an actual business. And part of that even talks about the great resignation and everything else. And so I think every organization and all leaders right now are in a position where we're all trying to figure that out right? You know, the, the hybrid work model, for example. Um, some people want fully from home, some people want fully from the office. And so you've got to try and balance that to make your humans happy and your teams happy. And when they're happy, they're going to produce. But at the same time, you need to still remember that we're running a business. And that's not always an easy balance. And that's not going to change. The environment's change. We still have to produce. And so you're still going to have to do some of the hard parts of our job. Um, I think sometimes with the psychological safety and the um, you know, awareness of mental health and some of those other pieces, it's very easy also to go to completely to the other side, which doesn't do anybody any favors. And so, you know, it's finding that, that middle ground um, that works for everybody. And I, I don't think it's easy right now for anybody. Yeah, no, really well said. Uh, Steve, what, what's not gonna, what will not change for leaders? You know, I think the big thing is leaders still need to connect with the people they work with, people on their teams, the people that they, you know, they interact with, uh, connecting and caring. I think that's, uh, we need to shift a little bit. It ties into what Nikki was mentioning, but, you know, we need to find leaders who care. And uh, there's a lot of people out there who are, we had gone through a couple of challenging years, but even prior to the pandemic, um, leaders need to really be intentional about connecting with their team. They need to be intentional about uh, making or developing relationships with their teams and uh, supporting them and, and really demonstrate that they care. There, there's so much research on this too, that, but uh, when, you know, when you feel like your leader cares about you, uh, it'll increase your performance. Plus it makes for a great day. I can tell you, I've learned most of my leadership lessons from having bad leaders back a long time ago and uh, leaders who really didn't care if I was there or you know, care to talk to me and maybe it was me, I don't know. But, uh, um, you know, I, I think that it's that connecting part and uh, connecting, uh, coaching, asking questions, you know, really trying to uncover who the person is. Because um, without that, I don't, I don't think we're, uh, I don't think it's strong. Yeah. And especially in a virtual or blended world, we've learned a whole new way. Um, you know, leaders have had to find a whole new way to connect in with those teams maintain those relationships you're not just walking down the hall and saying hey you know do you want to go for a grab a coffee and whatnot it, it has shifted how leaders have had to connect with their teams yeah. yeah and then how do you how do you connect by staring at this camera versus looking exactly. at the eye right exactly. and here's an interesting uh, thing it's a small thing but i know uh you know often we'll say how are you how are you doing like that's a typical thing if you want to shift it say how are you feeling and stop talking and see how the response, how different the response is. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah, and Craig, your point's so well uh, taken about the, you know, the Zoom, Zoom, and um, it's tough for sure. sure. Um, uh, so it, it's understanding that, that people do want to connect. It's it, it's just, a, it's human nature. We want to be part. There's also, uh, you know, there's lots of, you know, great, uh, uh, great impacts, I guess, when you're starting to connect, even this way, uh, you know, I'm going to get some brain chemical releases like, you know, yeah. uh, like oxytocin or, or dopamine or something like, you know, oxytocin, especially for the relationship things. So connecting. I just want to, so I'll leave it at, we need, leaders are going to continue to need to connect. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, although I was a little concerned when you said you learned more from your bad leaders. And oh my God. You, and we have Lauren another. Started, Lauren started to nod vigorously. So we I'm, got. Feeling Three. a little self-conscious now. You don't need to. Well, no, you're all good. We were we weren't going to use your name actually, but uh, that's, that's, that's yeah. entirely but fine. I tell you, you know, I often reflect and look back. I've had some terrible leaders when I started my career, and uh, but you know what? I'm really thankful for it though because I know what I don't want to be. Exactly. And and uh, and and uh, 
when I see that, if I, if I see it now, um, I, I, I know there's a remedy for it. And I, I don't think leaders are intentionally trying to be bad. I think it's just, you know, you need to learn the skill. It's a skill. It's a tough job to be a leader. It is. It is. Absolutely. Um, great conversation. There's a number of questions here. I think I want to try and get to. So um, in no particular order, um, either of you can jump in here. How does leadership look when uh, contracted individuals are part of the business structure? In other words, short term and long term hire to retire. Your, your hire to retire has resonated, Nikki. But I love that hire to retire, right? Yeah. Um, I think there's a couple things. I think if they're part of your team, they're part of your team. Um, and I think you need to treat them um, as part of your team. A leader should be looking at contractors in the same way. I do know, though, that being said, that there is, depending on what the, there's some contractual pieces that actually will shift how you're able to navigate that space. So it really depends on, um, I know some organizations through their supply chain that if you've got contractors, even providing feedback is something leaders are actually not able to do. The agreement with the vendors is that if they're not performing, that's the end of it. And so, you know, it really truly depends on what's happening or how your organization has that relationship with your contract workers. Um, employee development and leadership development, I think, falls in that same space. They should always be part of your team. They should be, you know, treated just as equally and, and kindly. And, and that connection piece that Steve has talked so, uh, so well about, that's still all. They're, they're human beings and are on your team and are, are there to be a part of your team. But I think it, it does, um, it does impact the leadership development side of it, it's completely based on how your organization is approaching that uh, vendor relationship, but they are still part of your team and building those connections and their contributions and creating that safe zone, psychological safety zone for them is, there is no difference uh, in my mindset, they're, they're team members. Yeah, excellent. And I saw Tara pop the comment in the chat as well to that point. And merrily I've seen your comments come past here and trying to keep up on them, but uh, lots of great stuff here. Steve, I'm gonna, this is like the rapid fire round. I'm gonna come to the next question here. Um, what, are this, what are some new ways and or best practices that leaders can use to keep a pulse on what is happening on the front lines? I, you know, a couple of things. And I, first of all, I think if leaders are, are, are connecting and having regular conversations with their, uh, their, their teams, they can certainly keep that. I think part of it, though, is, is understanding the power of coaching. And as it relates to coaching is how do you ask questions? How do you uncover information using questions? Um, and I, uh, uh, there, there are some very specific questions you can ask, for example, if you're meeting someone on a one-on-one about, you know, what do they feel proud about? What, what would they do differently? Um, what could the team do to be more effective or be a high-performing team? It, you know, it's constant contact. Uh, you know, the, the expression was leadership is a contact sport. And it's all about contacting people and being, being in the mix, not staying in your office. If you're in, back in the office, um, not, you know, not closing your door. Um, it's really about about being in front of people. And if it's on Zoom, uh, it, you know, we started doing these uh, open working sessions where it, it, at first it feels weird, but you just connect with a bunch of people and nobody talks. But it's like an open room. And then if you have a question, the person's there. You just, so it becomes very spontaneous. I just, it's, it's been a tremendous uh, thing for us to use as a, a tool. So the connecting. Cool. Back to connecting. I think, can I quickly add on to that too? I yeah. think too, this isn't necessarily a new way but make sure it's an authentic or genuine connection. Uh, we've all, you know, been in a situation, you know, how, you know, how are things going for you? You start talking and they're disengaged right away. They're just asking the question because they need to. And I think that's sometimes where we really do lose touch of what's happening on those front lines. So, you know, be curious, be genuine in your questions and, and pay attention to what, uh, what they're saying. Because if you're asking the questions and you're getting answers, you need to be able to act on those answers. I think sometimes that gets lost in the mix. Absolutely. Uh, and then that Question here, Lauren. I'm just curious if there was any questions in the chat that we might have missed. If you want to scroll back, well, we take this one. Um, one of the issues is the scarcity of good leadership in management, which ends up being translated as unqualified managers. How would you propose accommodating this lack of uh, good skill in a fast-paced environment while acknowledging the need of the market? Right, so lots, lots going on in the marketplace. 
And um, and scarcity, and this I think is going to emerge more and more as we we see the great resignation and and you know uh, demographic shifts go on. Um, thoughts around this? Yeah, excellent question. Um, I'm going to say that first of all, if you're if you're making leadership a priority in an organization, then it, it's something that starts day one with with all new anybody who starts in an organization and to really emphasize the importance of it. Um, there certainly is a scarcity of uh, maybe qualified employees, but if you have uh, an established leadership practice in your organization, um, it actually starts even before you start. It probably starts the day you sign a contract. And um, but you know, I think it's it's making the, making a priority and understanding the importance of it. I don't think it's a, a great idea to excuse bad leadership because of scarcity. Because I think I think there there becomes very negative negative impacts later on, um, and you hear this on a pretty regular basis. But uh, leaders, unfortunately, have a negative impact on the on a, the organization and the culture. Yeah, I, I agree, and I think sometimes what what tends to happen too is there is a scarcity out there, but look inside, look internal, um, and I agree. Like you, you you know, there's no a shortage of of um, you know, the talent pool is not permission to be a bad leader um, at all. And I think it's even more reason to hold people accountable um, because um, it's, it's, it's not your permission slip. And so I think if you've got a leader that's, that's, you know, truly not willing to change, not willing to develop, then look inside. Is there someone on the team? Give them an opportunity to step in as an interim. Um, you know, make those shifts because you may have a diamond in there that you're not even aware of that hasn't had that opportunity to bubble up because of poor leadership. And so I think there's really um, a huge opportunity there to look internal and might not be the perfect fit, but you don't know until you try. And it will most likely still be an improvement on the situation that is current. So don't always look outside. I agree, the pool is tight right now, but you've got an entire company of employees that you need probably have some outstanding people that have been overlooked. Yeah, yeah that's a fantastic uh, thought. Um, while we're on this subject, not this subject of bad leaders, but we we're talking about bad leadership in the prior question. Any advice on coaching up for those who work under leaders who don't have a growth mindset and or are quote unquote bad leaders? So Lauren, did you, you must have asked this question. I, she put Looking it in, an, it, it came in an honest an It came honest in as an alias, no. Right. Uh, well, Lauren, you need to have that conversation with Craig, but uh, uh, all kidding aside, um, part of it is having a coaching conversation and, and learning the, the power of coaching. Um, I've unfortunately been in this uh, position a few times and, uh, you know, it's really, uh, instead of uh, in the conversation kind of accusing someone, it's asking questions about, you know, do they understand what the impact they is, be, is on the team by their behaviors? And it's how you ask it, by the way, uh, can really make a difference. And what I've also found, too, is a lot of leaders don't even know that they're doing something. There's that lack of awareness. So it's you're helping them to be aware, but it's, it's asking open-ended questions that, uh, uh, once again, not to offend the leader or to, to get into a conflict, but it really does work. I mean, they're, they're, you know, coaching can be just a such a powerful tool for everybody, not just leaders, you know, it, anybody who works in organization. Absolutely. And I think too, you know, if, if you're having, we've all had to do it um, and we'll always continue to have to provide feedback up or down, right? And so I think, you know, if you've got, um, if your organization has leadership competencies or organizational competencies or like actual formalized values, like behaviors that are expected at all different levels, quite often that's a language that you can use. And so it actually makes it a lot easier for you to have those conversations. And so if Craig was my leader, I'm filling in for you here, Lauren. Craig was my leader and <laughs> some questions or, you know, he had done something that, that was, was not great. Um, you know, it's an opportunity and you take your emotion out of it. You stick to the fact to say, hey, Craig, have you got a second? Can I give you some feedback? Uh, like ask the permission because then you've opened up that door and you can say, you know, like, are one of our organizational competencies is communicates effectively. When you sent this email out or whatever it was, this is how it was received. And this is kind of not in alignment with, and you can use some of that language respectfully, but it actually is a great tool for providing that coaching and feedback and being able to relate it back to organizational behaviors that are expected 
gives you a bit of an, an out in an awkward situation. But Steve's right, a lot of the time they don't know and people yeah. are about feed, feeding up. And yeah. so they'll get rewarded for continued poor behavior if they don't know any different. Excellent. It's 9.56. Uh, this hour has flown past and I really want to thank you both. I feel very fortunate to have folks like you in my network that I can come to for these type of conversations. Thank um, you. Final thoughts from both of you. Steve, we'll, we'll start with you and just what's your final thought here around the future of leadership and leadership development? If you're well, gonna, just, give somebody to walk away from and go back and say to their company, hey, here's what we need to be thinking about. Uh, I'd say that uh, for me, I, leadership is absolutely critical, whether it's self-leadership or leading a team or others in an organization. Uh, it's very difficult to, to be a leader. And I think we need to provide some empathy towards the leadership. And that, uh, but it's a skill that can be learned. And it's, um, <clears throat> I don't believe there's natural born leaders. I think everybody can be a leader. And um, there's so many great resources out there to learn how to be a leader. And uh, it can actually be fun to learn some leadership skills because there's a lot of pretty cool uh, topics out there that you can use both in the office and outside of the office and maybe in your volunteer work as well. Excellent. Okay. Nikki, final word to you, final thoughts. Final thoughts. Uh, everybody has leadership capabilities, uh, like Steve said. And I think, you know, from an organization perspective, you should be, you know, thinking about how you're going to develop your people from higher higher to return entry level right the way up. What are their potentials? And I think too, is just making sure you're continuously rechecking what you're doing with your culture. Is this the culture we want to set and how are you holding your leaders accountable as they go through those programs? But leadership is awesome. Um, and there's, you know, it doesn't have to be formal. I think it's, it's, it's what will drive your business and drive your company. So just invest the time and the effort for sure. Perfect. <laughs> well, I, we've got copious notes here. The questions that we couldn't get to, I may uh, try and draw on our panelists to give me some of their thoughts afterwards and we'll try and send them out. But other than that, Nikki, Steve, Lauren, thank you so much for thank you. Uh, participating. Well, morning. thank you. And thanks, thanks to everybody who uh, showed up today. Lots of yes. great comments. Fantastic comments, by the way. Yeah, that's thanks, great. Everyone. All right, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Have a great Take day. Care. And Take care. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Take care.